So no matter where you are, where you are in your spiritual journey, you are celebrated here. And let's do begin as we do in silence. Just uh, gather yourself before we begin. May grace be in our heads and in our thinking. May grace be in our eyes and in our seeing. May grace be in our ears and in our hearing. May grace be in my mouth and in my speaking. May grace be in our hearts and in our understanding. And may grace be at our ends and at our departing. My assertion is that all of us, not just us, but everyone, is living in the sacred stream, whether we are aware of it or not. And one of the goals and hopes of spiritual work is to increase our awareness of where we are. And I don't think that there's any way that I could stand here today and talk about what I want to talk about today without referencing what happened late yesterday with the attempt on Donald Trump's life. Um, when I was in high school, there was within 20 miles of the home where I lived a lynching. This was in um, the 1950s in Tennessee. And there was no mention of that in church. There was no mention of that in... Huh? We, that was not, there was not mention. And um, I think it got a little bit of blurb in one of the, the daily paper in our town. And uh, that was it. And even then, I knew the... Uh, the lack of harmony that existed between what the church said and what we did. Um, and they were, they were really, really wonderful people. But that was never mentioned. We were very concerned about what happened to people in Africa, that their souls get saved. But nearby, not so much. So years pass, and um, I go away from that hometown and go to school, get a job, lose that job. In many ways, um, was a disappointment and violated many of the things that my parents had hoped for for me. But somewhere in <clears throat> 1966 or 67, I went back to visit my parents and um, it was the same environment. You, some of you remember the 60s. It's a time of great upheaval, particularly in the South and in Tennessee, where there were freedom riders and all that sort of thing. And um, a black activist by the name of Rep Brown, you may remember him, gave a talk about black activism in which he said that violence was as American as cherry pie. It's been misquoted to say he said apple pie, but he said cherry pie. And I brought that up to my parents. I kind of knew what their response would be. But my, I, I can't remember many things that I've said or done that my parents took more offense at. That America's not a violent country. You don't know what you're talking about and that sort of thing. But we are. We are. And that violence showed itself yesterday. <clears throat> After hearing about the um, attempt on Donald Trump's life, um, I would turn on the TV and then turn it off almost immediately 
and then later turn it on again to see the same scene. They were looping the same shot over and over and over. Remember like when 9-11 happened and they show the planes going into the buildings over and over and over and just was awful. And um, a thing that stood out for me, I don't, I'm sure you've seen those photographs. Those, I'm sure everybody's here has seen that clip in one version or the other. The, the, the thing that stood out for me were the people in the crowd who were giving fingers to the camera. And I don't know what that was about. Were they angry at being photographed? Were they angry at the shooter? Were they angry at somebody else? But it was an expression of that rage. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later. All this is not in my notes, but... One of the things that uh, I have been reading and, and am heading toward in, in my teaching is that it's one thing for us to say that violence in America is bad. Like, it's one thing for us to say that racism is bad or poverty is bad. And then we do our, I know what we do is important, but we do things that more deal with individual situations than the origin of the system itself. And there's something in the system in our country that is causing people to be so angry. And we've got to figure out a way to say that, to speak to that. Because I think what we saw yesterday is not the end of what we're going to see. By the way, this talk begins on this unhappy note. It's going to end on an unhappy note. I'll just give you a heads up. And that's the gospel. There's no way to get to where I want to go in the teaching I want to do without going through the territory that I want to introduce you to today, okay? This is so much fun. Being in the sacred stream, adhering to what we want to do about the teaching of Jesus, focuses on two things. What does it mean to love God? So you've got to wrestle with who and where is God. And what does it mean to love our neighbor? Those are the two things that Jesus talked about. So here we are in the sacred stream, and streams are made up of these drops of water. I got this image of a drop of water off a physics site on the internet. Drops of water like this are beautiful. When you get a bunch of drops of water together, you get what we got last week. And that's violence and destructive. If you put even more drops of water, you get together this, which is a picture I saved from Harvey. This is I-10 just east of downtown Houston. You remember Harvey. That's a drop of water. And then if you get a lot of drops of water together, you get this, which is the Pacific Ocean. The largest ocean basin on our planet, 63 million square miles. More than half the world's water is right in that Pacific Ocean. Here's the first mention of a book. I'm going to live into this reputation of giving books. I own this book. This is a page from a book called Young's Analytic Concordance of the Bible. It has every word in Hebrew and Greek that is in the accepted canon of Christian scripture. This is one page in that book. This is a page that has all, a few of the entries in Young's Concordance that can turn, contain the word water in the Bible. So um, in the Bible, you have 
uh, stream used 24 times, river 300 times, flood over 100 times, and water or waters over 1,000 times in the scripture. Spring a bunch of times. Some of the most comforting, reassuring words in scripture are about water. The 23rd Psalm, he leadeth me by the still waters. Jesus referred to himself as uh, the living water, which if you consumed, you wouldn't need any more water. But that's not literally true because none of us can exist without water for more than 72 hours. And our bodies are made up of mostly water. In case you can't read the caption, it says, uh, the angels are asking God, do you think 78% water is too squishy? So water is used for uh, a lot of things. Water is a metaphor for success. Did you know that? In, in, <clears throat> in teaching these classes, I like to have a map to follow. Like going through the parables or going through the Sermon on the Mount or doing something because that way I can know <clears throat> weeks ahead of time what I'm going to be talking about and I can look for things to fit that. Here's a map. This is a map and I'm going to draw a line on the map that goes from, <coughs> pardon me, Lake Powell, which is in um, Nevada to Lake Mead, which is... Um, in Arizona. There's the arrow right there. Hmm? From Utah to Arizona. Or is it Arizona to Utah? It's one of those. The other way around. You can't go from Lake Powell to Lake Mead in a straight line unless you're in an airplane. So on maps, we can draw straight lines, but maps don't tell you the difficult terrain that you have to go through to get there. Where are you going? It's drops of water that went from Lake, the area of Lake Powell to Lake Mead that over a long period of time formed the Grand Canyon by following the path of least resistance. Now, the sacred stream invokes all these things about water and more. It's life-giving. It's life-taking. It's dangerous. It's exciting. It's beautiful. It's all those things that you can think about about water. And although physical death is unavoidable for all of us, even if you have a daily spiritual practice, there is no spiritual teacher in any tradition that I know of who does not say that on this journey, you will have to experience death of some kind. The saints in the Christian tradition refer to it as the dark night of the soul. Um, we'll talk about some other traditions in a moment. But it means dying to one way of life and being open to something others. And teachers like Jesus will say, and this has been my personal experience, that this death is not something that happens once, but over and over and over at different levels that we've talked about of our journey. As the saying goes in Buddhism, things arise and they fall away. Things arise and they fall away. But more about that in a moment. Now, spiritual work and a spiritual teacher is supposed to entice people to be willing to be open to these deaths, to embrace them, so that we can die to one way of life or one level of consciousness and then move to another. And the precursor of this death in Christian lingo is called crucifixion. 
It is very ironic to me that the very religion that teaches crucifixion tries to protect people from crucifixion by saying, don't worry, it's not that big a deal. In three days, everything is going to be okay. which is a gross misunderstanding of resurrection. So today, and as far into the future as I am able to see at the moment, because you never know on the sacred stream what flooding or deviation may occur, I'm going to use as we make our way forward in the sacred stream, three primary resources. I will mention them today, and I won't keep mentioning them in the future. I'll do my best. <laughs> One of them is Stephen Mitchell's book, The Gospel According to Jesus. This book is available on your Kindle or e-reader, and most of the book is an introduction about why Jesus emphasized God as Father and the role of forgiveness in his teaching. It's really worth reading. I promise you it's not anything you hear in Sunday school. The other book, uh, one of the other books is Leo Tolstoy's The Gospel in Brief, which I said last week is not brief. And most people have not heard of this particular gospel. But Tolstoy is really quite a scholar of Greek and of history. It's, a, it's um, unless, you're, unless you're interested in doing something like I do, I don't think you'd be interested in this book, but I do think it's important to know that it exists, that it's out there. And then, of course, uh, the gospel of, of Jesus according to um, Robert Funk, which he was the head of the Jesus Seminar out of the West R Institute. Very, very brief book. You can still get this, I think, in paper on, on um, Amazon. The only other book that is uh, Gospel of Jesus is the one that Thomas um, Jefferson did, where he took scissors to the scripture and cut out what offended him. <laughs> Seriously. But it's not a very scholarly book, but I, that's the only one, other one that I know. Now, I mentioned last week, it makes me a smidgen anxious to talk about Jesus. Because most of you who are in this gathering, either in person or watching online, fall into one of two categories. On the one hand, you have heard about Jesus all of your church going life and maybe have had it up to here. Or, on the other hand, you have been significantly wounded in one way or another by the organization that uses his name. And frankly, as much as I love and respect every one of you, truly, I cannot imagine any of you, any of you, getting up tomorrow and going to work and saying to a colleague, by the way, what do you think Jesus really meant you don't have those kind of conversations outside of here, do you? I didn't think so. I, I may be wrong, but I think Jesus is a problem for both progressives and conservatives. <clears throat> the words progressive and conservative are not adequate, but I couldn't think of any others to use. What I mean by progressive are people who have an open stance, a stance that's focused on the common good, and we progressives like to assume that Jesus would be the kind of person who shares the values that we have. If you see a sign outside a church that says, all are welcome, you know that that's code language for, we welcome people of the LGBTQI plus community, right? Somebody sent me this meme. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
You know those conservative churches that have big screens at the front? I guarantee you nobody's showing this slide today. <laughs> so you will recall that when I introduced the, the origin of the phrase, what would Jesus do? That phrase came from a book that was written, a fictional book, that was written really by a progressive pastor for a progressive congregation. As a matter of fact, the In His Steps book was part of the origin of the social gospel movement uh, back in the early part of the 20th century when it happened. Not a conservative movement at all. And <clears throat> the book is about what happened when in this very progressive church, some man, very like Jesus, came and appealed to the congregation for help, and they shunned him. Politely, but shunned him. And I've often wondered, we, a welcoming church, what we would do if when we were giving free lunches to people across the street every Sunday, if all those people were to come to our 11 o'clock worship service some Sunday, how that would rest with folks. I think it might make folks a little uncomfortable. But we're tolerant. But I just wonder, are all people welcome here? Now, if anyone in the Christian nationalist movement gave it a moment's thought, the last thing anybody in this movement wants to do is what Jesus would do. If someone like Jesus moved into a Christian nationalist neighborhood, they would move out. Because I don't think Jesus would be part of any organization especially one that bore his name if it excluded anyone. And it's so ironic that one of the greatest impediments in coming face to face with Jesus is the church. Progressive or conservative. It's just when any of us move outside our tribal loyalties, we just have trouble. So today... I'm going to lift two stories out of what scholars refer as the database of Jesus' teaching and try to show how they speak or can speak to what it means to be involved in the sacred stream. And although this is in my notes, they refer really explicitly to what happened yesterday. You are aware, by the way, that Christian nationalists in um, two states, Louisiana and Oklahoma, have passed laws that the Ten Commandments be posted in state schools. You're aware of this. Everybody knows that. Did you know that the, the Ten Commandments posted are not the ones that are in the Bible? Did you know that? They're the ones that come from, believe it or not, Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments movie. I am not making this up. If you want to know what the Ten Commandments say, um, go read Exodus 34. And you will see that the Ten Commandments that they are going to, and in Texas too, the Ten Commandments that are listed have all the Judaic elements taken out of them. Christian nationalists don't know the Bible and they sometimes have difficulty with the truth. So Christian nationalists state that America is a Christian nation that they should control every facet of the country's politics and nothing could be more un-American than that. So I want you to know that I am so grateful to be able to do this. I'm grateful that you are here. I'm great. I hope that you end up being grateful that you spent the precious moments of your life here today. However, there's that theological word again. However, 
there is no way to talk about the specific kinds of death I have mentioned over the last four months without experiencing crucifixion. The organized versions of Christianity have produced a mixed bag of results, as I indicated last week in talking about finding religion with religion. Had it not been for organized religion preserving the rituals and stories, two of which I'm going to use today, we would not be here enjoying these stories, learning from them, and also having the freedom to critique the very institution that gave them to us. So I, I, I mentioned two places where this has happened before getting into the stories. First uh, is the illusion that the church has created that the Jesus journey has a happy ending. It doesn't. It ultimately has a victorious ending, but it does not have a hallmark happy ending. We have been led to skip over matters that involve what everyone who qualifies for the designation of saint on this path has referred to as a dark night of the soul. Uh, you know, don't worry about that. That's for special people. The fact is that if you read the story, Jesus himself was abandoned by God. Resurrection was not experienced as some three day later, ta-da, a back event. It took years for these Jewish followers of Jesus going back into Jewish studies, scripture, to be able to come to an understanding of what resurrection meant for them. Second, it has been the falsehood that a simple acknowledgement that Jesus is somehow special and has done all the dirty work for us. So that we can look to that religion that offers that teaching as a way to help us escape from the terrors of what it means to be involved here and now and the prospect of death. Because in the sweet by and by, everything will be fine. God protected Jesus from nothing. And we are asked to follow in his steps. So, as I said, I'm going to lift two stories out. And <clears throat> listener discretion advised. We will be left hanging. The first of these stories is about a man possessed of demons. Now, you've heard this story before. If you have, some of you have heard it multiple times. You will know that in the story, the man was given the name Legion, which I will tell you about in a moment. I'm going to use Eugene Pat Peterson's translation of this story. He gives the man another name. Here's the story, and the image I'm using is from a medieval illuminated manuscript of the Bible. They arrived on the other side of the sea in the country of the Gethsemanes. As Jesus got out of the boat, a madman from the cemetery came up to him. He lived there among the tombs and graves. No one could restrain him. He couldn't be chained, couldn't be tied down. He'd been tied up so many times with chains and ropes, but he broke the chains and snapped the ropes. No one was strong enough to tie him. Night and day, he roamed through the graves and hills, screaming out and smashing, slashing himself with sharp stones. When he saw Jesus a long way off, he ran and bowed in worship before him, then bellowed in protest, What business do you have, Jesus, son of the high God, messing with me? I swear to God, don't you give me a hard time. But Jesus had just commanded the tormenting evil spirit, Get out, out of the man. Jesus asked the man, Tell me your name. 
He replied, my name is Mob. I'm a rioting mob. Then he desperately begged Jesus not to banish him from the country. A large herd of pigs was browsing and rooting on a nearby hill. The demons begged him, send us to the pigs so that we can live in them. Jesus gave the order, but it was even worse for the pigs than for the man. Crazed, they stampeded over a cliff and into the sea and drowned. This story is in all three of what we call the synoptic gospels. That would be Luke, Matthew, I mean Mark, Matthew, and Luke in the order in which they were written. And they're called synoptic gospels because they seem to see things through the same eye. That's one of the criteria scholars use for determining if something is more or less really part of the original Jesus teaching. The frequency with which a story is, is used. Okay, so here's the next story. They are connected. Later in the day, he said to them, let's go across to the other side. Now, if you get Stephen Mitchell's gospel, or you get Robert Funk's gospel, or you read the gospel of Mark, you will see that phrase happening again and again and again. Jesus goes over. He goes across. He goes next. He goes, he's, and that's a metaphor for crossing boundaries and building bridges. And it, it's repeated multiple times in Scripture. Code language. That's what Jesus envisioned for the world as he knew the world. They took him in the boat as he was. Other boats came along. A huge storm came up. This is Rembrandt's painting. Waves threatened to pour into the boat, threatening to sink it. Jesus was in the stern, head on a pillow, sleeping. They roused him, saying, Teacher, is it nothing to you that we're going to drown? Awake now, he told the wind to pipe down and said to the sea, Quiet, settle down. The wind ran out of breath. The sea became smooth as glass. Jesus reprimanded the disciples. Why are you such cowards? Don't you have any faith at all? They were in absolute awe, staggered. Who is this anyway? They'd been hanging out with him. They ask, wind and sea at his beck and call. Now, we've been taught to call these two stories miracles. First miraculous thing I remember seeing was this. <laughs> I'm probably about four when I saw my first kaleidoscope. It uh, was probably cost a dime. Probably actually came from a place we called in, the, in my youth, the dime store. Anybody even remember that? This is one of my addictions that I'm willing to talk publicly about. I have in my lifetime probably owned over 100 kaleidoscopes. I learned as I became an, really quite an authority on kaleidoscopes that what makes the beautiful pattern in a kaleidoscope is broken pieces of glass. Isn't that a wonderful metaphor? That broken pieces of glass looked at correctly can create something like this. Or something like this. These are patterns created by glass kaleidoscopes. Um, wheel kaleidoscopes, you've seen kaleidoscopes with wheels on the end of them you can probably have a configuration where you could duplicate a pattern. It would be hard, but you could do that. But with these kind of kaleidoscopes, the patterns are infinite. I bought and, and collected kaleidoscopes. There's a kaleidoscope collector society. You can look them up online called the Brewster Society. And when we moved, I divested myself of all but about 40 of my kaleidoscopes. 
Every kaleidoscope that I currently own, I think, is signed by the artist and copyrighted. At the uh, this is not my notes, it's embarrassing to say, but at the beginning of our marriage, for our first Christmas together, Sherry gave me a kaleidoscope modeled after a Brewster kaleidoscope for which, this is almost 50 years ago, she paid $1,000. I have no idea what it might be worth today. I bought a set of um, wooden kaleidoscopes, a wood base with interchangeable lenses at a street fair in Seattle in 1983 or four for $165. And five years later, I saw it on the market for 800. The husband and wife who made that kaleidoscope made this kaleidoscope, which you can buy. This is wood and uh, right and right woodworkers made this kaleidoscope, which you can buy. It's still on the market today for $26,000. Just saying. If you're looking for an anniversary present for your sweetheart, The teachings of Jesus are like kaleidoscopes. You look through them and you twist them and you get another picture and you get another picture, another picture, another picture. Just amazing. When I first started learning and, and teaching about Jesus stories, I did so from a psychological point of view. I wanted to take principles of psychology and blend them with principles of theology or religion. I called it mind and spirit work. And now I see that they were never separated in the first place altogether. And then if you turn the scope of it, I taught Jesus stories from a religious point of view because I'm big on emphasizing religious literacy. What did he really say? What was the historical context in which he said it? And it didn't take much of a twist to get thoroughly into the Jesus of history arena. Marcus Borg, who's taught from this place at least twice, when he taught about Jesus, he was the living authority when he was alive. He was the living authority on Jesus in the English-speaking world. That title now belongs to his colleague, John Dominic Crossan, who's also preached at St. Paul's. When Borg started doing his work, he didn't want to upset even progressive people. So he made a distinction between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith, which is still a division. Now we know that the way that Jesus himself was first experienced and the way that he expressed himself was in what we call mytho-poetic language. And this is the way the Jews interpreted scripture. And it is the way they wrote scripture, what we call scripture. They did not write it as a news report. The stories that you have heard me read today are mytho-poetic stories. So to believe that they are literally true abuses them. Faith, believing that faith has to do mostly with what is factually true or literally true is an abuse of faith in the highest order. So the first followers of Jesus were Jews. Their interpretation of scripture was multi-layered. They <clears throat> held it that their writings could be looked at <clears throat> historically, ethically, psychologically. They didn't know that word, but that what we would call psychologically and mystically all at the same time. Like a kaleidoscope. So the way that I want to entice you to think about Scripture is that the proper interpretation is that we learn to inhabit the story and to allow the story to inhabit us 
both at the same time. Another way of saying what I just said <clears throat> is to see what is mythic poetic as more real than what we call reality. One of the first things from a clinical experience I learned in Jungian analysis is this very fact. I remember vividly saying to my analyst that I had a dream that was very disturbing and that when I woke from the dream, my heart was pounding and I was so relieved to find out that it was just a dream. And that's when I learned that you don't say that to a union analyst. <laughs> because the reprimand I got was that what happens in the inner world is often much realer than what happens in the outer world. So you might want to train yourself to do that. Talk about the inner world and the outer world instead of the real world being out there because the real world's in here. It's what Thomas Merton meant when he wrote, what is hidden beneath the literal meaning is not merely another and more hidden meaning. It is a new and totally different reality. Now, this has been my experience that when I come to come to terms with what is, and this is one of the three non-negotiables in the sacred stream, the more capable we are of seeing and appreciating the miraculous. So the miracle stories that are in the Jesus narrative are not there for us to debate about whether they, quote, really happened or not. The point of the story is what the story conveyed. So let's go back and look at these two stories. I've given a talk today the title, this title, which is not pronounceable. Because it means two things. It means a way to nowhere, which is the title of one of my favorite books on Buddhist meditation, Being Nobody, Going Nowhere. And it can also be read a new way to now here which is the heart of Jesus' teaching, to be present, to be here, both at the same time. Now, everybody, every one of us knows what it's like to be the guy named Legion. The word Legion was a dig at the Roman occupation that occurred at the time. A Legion was um, part of the Roman army, three to 600 men in the army. But I like that mob title too. Everybody here has been demon possessed. You don't want to admit that, but it's true. <laughs> Everybody here has said to some loved one after you made a complete jackass of yourself, God, I don't know what got into me. Like something outside came in and made us, we've all been possessed. And we have all seen people. And it's easier to see this in other people than it is in yourself. But you can see the people who were involved on both sides of that political rally last night who were possessed. Something from the unconscious had reached up and grabbed that 20-year-old young, 20 young man and had pulled him into destruction. He was possessed. And so were the people who were shooting the finger at whoever they were doing that after that incident. They were possessed. And you have been, I have been, in our lifetimes, possessed by things that caused us, after the fact, to look back and say, God, God, I do not know what I was thinking. And the fact is that we weren't thinking. We were possessed. 
Something from the unconscious had grabbed us by the throat and was killing us. So the story depicts a man who is horribly fragmented. And he encounters Jesus and he is made whole, integrated. Now in the next scene, you see the sea. And the sea is the way it is because it's now filled with the demonic. That's what happened. The pigs got the demons. The demons went into the sea. The pigs are, the demons are now at the bottom of the sea. And the boat is on the surface of the sea. And um, under the sea, there are all these demons. Now, I can't prove this which means I know it's true. But I think most people don't, and this does not imply anybody here, but just don't take this personally, okay? <laughs> I think most people don't pick up a daily spiritual practice because they don't want to encounter what's down there. Thirty years ago, following Sherry's lead, I went away, over 30 years ago now, I went away for a training in the 10-day meditation process, Vipassana training, which lasts 10 days, 10 solid days. We spent 16 and a half hours a day meditating in total silence. Couldn't speak to a person, couldn't look a person in the face for 10 solid days. On the second day of our training, we were told, tomorrow we will have t two sits, of strong determination. A strong determination means that when you sit, you don't move a muscle for two hours, except to breathe. Got a bug crawling on you, you just sit there. It's funny, again, this is not my notes, but I was assigned a place in the meditation hall, and immediately back here to my right and right behind me, a young Buddhist monk was assigned a place. And, and uh, he was in his full Buddhist monk regalia. And uh, every, every, every morning at 6.30 when we would begin, he would float in and sit on his meditation cushion and not move. I hated him. <laughs> in this training where we were training to be non-judgmental, How could he do that so easy and effortlessly? The most frequent comment I got when I came back from that was, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. I understand that. It's hard. And about day seven, with no TV, no radio, no reading, no writing, no talking, the stuff begins to come up. Thich Nhat Hanh says of this kind of medication, medication, it, 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 medication might be a right word. Uh, it's like taking a muddy jar and just setting it on a windowsill and leaving it for days. And after a while, the mud begins to settle and you can see clearly. One of my favorite sayings from the Gospel of Thomas, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you fail to bring forth what is within you, what you fail to bring forth will destroy you. So the disciples are on the surface of the sea. Water is more often than not in dreams and stories a symbol for the unconscious. The water is stormy, it's terrifying. You remember at the beginning of the Jesus narrative, Jesus has this encounter with Satan where he goes into the desert for 40 days. He's got the unconscious out in front of him and has done deal with it. So he's in the boat. He's not scared. Sometimes what's within people causes people to behave in ways that they take their own lives. Sometimes physically, those of you who've had a loved one or known somebody who's completed the act of suicide, know that leaves a wound that never heals. 
in, in our American culture, if we hear that somebody has attempted suicide very frequently, the response is, was he successful? As if success is a word that should be applied to that, but that's American mentality. There are a lot of people who, though they never complete the act of suicide, never come close to being alive either. Mary Oliver, the poet, captured that passion for me when she said, I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Now, most of us have an image that we want to put out there for other people to see. And then we hide a lot of material from the rest of the world. I think that's probably a socially polite thing to do. Not every aspect of ourselves need to find expression everywhere, but we need to be aware of them. Because if we're not, they will grab us. Notice what gets your goat. The goat that phrase comes from horse racing, you know that? They used to put a goat in the stall of the horse that was racing and uh, keep the horse calm, and somebody would steal the goat, it'd upset the horse. That's where that came from. So notice where you get your goat. Gets my goat when somebody parks in a disabled parking space and then runs like an, an Olympic athlete into the store. However, I really want to be treated with preferential treatment myself. Right? That's my shadow. It burns me up when pe I see people talking on their cell phones in their car, risking other people's lives. Now, when I do it, I got a good reason. <laughs> now, I want you to notice something about the story that never gets commented on in church, ever. I've never in all my life heard this comment on. So Jesus calms the storm in the story. And now, the disciples are more terrified than they were before. And they say, who is this guy that even this is happening? This isn't supposed to be. Now, the way you and I might understand that is something like, oh, my God. What have I gotten myself into following this path? This journey is not predictable. There are storms ahead. No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this, you carry precious cargo, so watch your step and see you here next week. <laughs> <laughs>